You know, I, I love that song because it helps me appreciate a few things that I often don't. Do you know that the most often cited command in all the Bible is not to love God in others? Although that is the greatest commandment. The most often cited command in scripture is not to do good deeds. Even though by doing good things, we prove that we do have faith. The most often cited command in scripture is not to live in sexual purity. Even though sexual sin affects us as no other sin does. The most often cited command in all of scripture is two little words. Fear not. Fear not. Now, why is that? Well, I think it's because God understands that fear is the most basic emotion. It is the most powerful motivator in our lives. And as such, it is something that causes us to be most susceptible to it as a stronghold. Yes, in many ways, fear can be our friend, but it can also be a great nemesis when it is a liar to us. And so uh, whether you are here in the Frisco campus today or you are online or watching in McKinney, I wanna say a few things that I think are pretty safe to say. I believe that 100% of us here today, here in the hearing of my voice or watching online, we all have experienced fear at one time in our lives or other. We also, 100% of us, have succumbed to fear in one moment or another. And I think if we were honest, we could all say that I am not all I could be in this moment if fear had not had a foothold in my life at some time. Because fear is such a predominant force in our lives, I'm excited that we get to talk about that today. And as we talk about it, we're gonna utilize one of uh, the most familiar passages of scripture found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I would encourage you to turn there in your Bible or in your device. And uh, we're gonna look at this story. When 1 Samuel 17 opens up, there is a conflict going on between the children of God, the nation of Israel, and the Philistines. Here's a picture of a map. You will see here this light yellow area is the nation uh, or the, the territory of Philistia. Uh, they were sea people. They, they sailed a lot, but they wanted to expand eastward. And so there were skirmishes back and forth. And because battles and warring was really a messy deal back in that time frame, they would often do this thing called like a battle of champions. And so one army would select a representative and the other army would select their representative and they would kind of fight to the death and kind of winner would take all, you know, it might be money or it might be territory or land. And that's where we are when 1 Samuel 17 opens up. And the setting is the Valley of Elah, uh, which is beautiful. And you can see this is the place where uh, the armies of Israel and the armies of the Philistines were kind of on both sides looking down into this valley where they saw Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, kind of go to the center of the ring and he would cajole and he would trash talk the Israelites to send out their representative. Now you need to know that Goliath was nine feet tall. That's 27 inches taller than LeBron. His armor weighed 125 pounds, and the javelin, the spear that he used, was the diameter of a soda can, and the tip of it weighed 125 pounds. He was a big dude. And let me tell you, if he saw Conor McGregor at the beach, he would have kicked sand in his face. And quite frankly, that's what he was doing to the Israelites every day because he would come down not once a day, but twice a day. And for 40 days, he was challenging the Israelites and the Israelites had no taker. No one was willing to fight him until David. 
David actually wasn't at the front. He was back home being a shepherd boy. His dad put together some care packages for his oldest three sons, and David takes the care packages to the front. And when he gets there, he gets there just in time for the Goliath morning show, and he watches Goliath come out, defy the God of Israel, and to, you know, kind of trash talk them uh, in Philistine talk, and, and the people of God, the soldiers of Israel would turn and run. And he's going, oh my gosh, this guy's defying our God, he's defying our nation and with impunity. And so David begins to ask questions about this. He also learns at that time that Saul the king was offering a reward for anybody who would go out there. He's trying to you know, incentivize people to go. And here is the reward. They would get one of his daughters in marriage and this guy's entire family would be tax exempt for life. Now, David is so intrigued by this reward that he goes and he confirms this with two other groups of soldiers. Well, word gets to Saul that, hey, there's this young guy who wants to fight Goliath. He calls him to HQ and he goes, oh my gosh, this is, you're a kid. And he goes, but wait a minute, I can fight Goliath. God has been with me in the pasture land. I was able to fight and kill a bear and a lion with my own hands. I'm your guy. And so Saul's not quite convinced, so he offers him his armor, his kingly armor, but it's too big for David, and it's really kind of awkward and clunky. David takes it off and says, here, maybe next time. And so he heads out of the tent. On the way to the Valley of Eli, he picks up five smooth stones, and there he sees Goliath waiting for him. Now, Goliath is really disappointed that it's David coming to fight him. Because he's a little pipsqueak, and he, and he says this, hey, am I a dog that you send a little stick to beat me? Now, and see, Goliath wanted some competition, but as in his mind, this was gonna be like Alabama playing a Division II directional school, and it wasn't gonna be all that much fun. And so David says, hey, 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 wait a minute, buddy. You may think I'm a little stick, but today my God is going to conquer you, and I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to cut off your head, and then all of your Philistine brothers are going to end up dead meat, and I mean dead meat because the birds and the animals are going to have them for lunch. And what does David do? He takes one of those smooth stones out, and he, he winds it around his head, and he hits Goliath right between the eyes. He does a face plant in the dirt. David gets Goliath's sword, separates his head from his body, and his prophecy is true. The slower Philistines who can't you know, get to the head of the pack, they are caught by the Israelites, and they are killed, and they become a feast for the aviary and animal communities of that part of the world. That's it. It happens. Now, this story is familiar, but there's some really fresh insights to help us understand how to deal with fear when it becomes a stronghold in our lives. Now, before we really delve into it, we need to take a quick look at the nature of fear itself. Fear can be a friend. Fear is a friend when it prompts the, th the physiological and the emotional response which motivate and, and empower us to avoid danger. Like if you're out hiking and you come up on this dude, you're gonna be really glad your body is sending out all kinds of adrenaline so you can get away from this guy. And quite frankly, fear can be really helpful. It might remind us not to go down a dark alley at night or to exceedingly pass the speed limit or to go into business with a partner that seems to be a little bit toxic. Or fear might cause us to rethink getting married when we have those real checks and we may be getting married for the wrong reasons and we stop before we say, I do. Fear can be a friend when it causes us to make decisions that help us avoid danger. Now, fear is also our foe, though, when it becomes irrational or manipulative irrational or manipulative. Not all fears are rational. In fact, many of the fears that you just heard sung about aren't rational. They, we, we sometimes allow things to frighten us that really have no reason to harm us. And when we are frightened by and kind of immobilized by things that really can't hurt us, those are often called phobias. And uh, phobia is kind of a, an, an expression of mental illness, and there's some really interesting phobias. Ar arachibutyrophobia, anybody heard of that? That is a fear 
of getting peanut butter stuck on the roof of your mouth. Have you ever had that fear? Pantherophobia is the fear of your mother-in-law. Some of you guys have that. You know, you didn't know it, but you, you have a phobia. Nomophobia is fear of not having cell phone service. We all have that fear, right? Uh, and then phobophobia is simply the fear of having a phobia. And so there are times when fear is a foe when it is not rational and when we really shouldn't be afraid of it. But fear is also a foe when it is used to manipulate us. And because fear is such a powerful emotion in us, a lot of people take advantage of that. And the three biggest offenders of using fear to motivate people are first, pastors, preachers, and the church throughout the years, especially in the Middle Ages, hell was held over people, and that was the way the church in the Middle Ages kind of kept everybody in line. That's the way in the 50s, evangelists got people to sign on the dotted line for Jesus because the good news was always kind of started by talking about how bad the other news is, right? And so we, if we're not careful, we can motivate people with fear. Do you know marketers are the second most guilty of this? Uh, you're gonna see a bottle of Listerine. Listerine wasn't selling all that well. And so the maker said, we gotta figure out how to create some fear. So they go all the way back to the a Latin word halitosis, which means bad breath in Latin. And so they created this fear and did commercials to let everyone know that we all have halitosis and you don't wanna have it, so you need to buy Listerine. And sales went through the roof. Now here's the third biggest offender of motivating with fear, politicians. And we just got through a bunch of political stuff where we heard one of two messages. You're not gonna have a country anymore or democracy is gonna be destroyed, right? So we kept hearing this and what people do is they will elevate and escalate fear in us so that we will vote the way they want us to vote, all right? That gets us all back to always thinking about, okay, <laughs> Is this rational or not? Now, there are three signs that I want you to be aware of that will indeed help you recognize whether or not fear is a phobia for you. Not a phobia, fear is a stronghold for you. Here's the first one. Fear might be a stronghold for you if you find yourself paralyzed by your fear. You might be like all those Israeli soldiers who couldn't respond to a Goliath, and they were lining up every day like deer in the headlights. I mean, they were stuck. They didn't know what they were gonna do. Who's gonna respond? No, you respond. No, I, I can't respond. No, you respond. And they, they were like deer in the headlights, and they couldn't make a decision. You also might have fear as a stronghold if indeed uh, your fear minimizes your perspective. You know, when fear is a stronghold for you, your confidence shrinks your sense of self-esteem shrinks. Here's a picture of a guy who's kind of shrunken and he's afraid of a woman in his life for some reason, but he is, because of his fear, he is shrinking down. Uh, another thing happens, your view of God shrinks. That all of a sudden, God becomes irrelevant to you and God doesn't have the strength or the power to overcome any fear that you have. So if you find yourself being minimized and your perspective is minimized, fear might be a stronghold for you. And then here's the other one. Your fear demonizes others. That there are times when we are afraid of people or afraid of a movement or an organization or something that we demonize them and we label them as being evil and dangerous. And that they have no redemptive qualities about them. And that if we can do that, what, what that means is, is that now when they thwart us or they threaten us or they hinder us, we can do anything or say anything or write anything on social media about them because they're really like demonic. I have a halo over my head, but the people I demonize, well, they have horns. And when you demonize people, it, it gives you a false freedom to do things and say things you would never do otherwise. So if you're demonizing other tribes or other races or other organizations or other political parties, you, you name it, fear is probably 
a real, has a real foothold in your life, all right? Now here's the question. This is the one we're asking. This is the money question. So then how do we break free from fear uh, as a stronghold in our lives? Well, in the story of David, there are three actions they're simple actions, and they work together. And if you can capture these in your mind, uh, as you lead today, I think you're going to have a real weapon in your own arsenal of life that will help you break free from fear. We're gonna, I'm going to talk to you about thinking and about trusting and about acting. So if you want to break free from the stronghold of fear, you have to start thinking differently. And here is a way you can think differently. You begin to think about the story that fear is telling you. Whenever you're afraid, whenever uh, something comes and it startles you and it knocks you off center in your life, think about the story that fear is telling you. And the story that fear was telling those Israelites was indeed, <laughs> we're too small. Uh, I'm not experienced enough. I'm not as strong as this guy. But here's the thing. That was a legitimate fear for some of the guys in the army, but not a legitimate fear for others. Some of the guys, when they were looking at Goliath, I am too small. I don't have any experience. I'm just like a farmer. I showed up to be a part of, you know, of Saul's army today. There's no way I can fight this guy. But there are other people, there were other people who were strong, and they were experienced soldiers, and they could have fought, but they didn't. And so you have to think about the story that fear is telling you to decide whether it is a legitimate fear or not. Think about the story that fear is telling you. So let me ask you, think about the thing you're most afraid of right now. What are you fearing? When you go to bed at night, what wakes you up at three o'clock in the morning and you can't go back to sleep? Now, what story is that fear telling you? And you have to think about that story to discern whether it is a legitimate fear or not or whether it's an irrational one. And that's the place you begin. Now, the next thing you need to do is this. You think about what is at stake if you overcome your fear. You know, if I, if I fight this, if I break free from this, you know, what will happen? What is on the other side of my fear? Now, David did this beautifully for him uh, here are some things that he, I'm going to go ahead and go to the passage of scripture. Uh, when he was walking around with his, you know, knapsack with a uh, care package from home, one of the soldiers says, have you seen the giant? The men ask. He comes out each day to defy, the, to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. So David is having to think about, well, you know, what if I'm the guy? What if I step down into that valley and fight the soldier? And so he's having to process, you know, what is at stake? And for him, there was one other thing that he was really concerned about, and I didn't have the text up for you, but he was concerned about how Goliath was defying the God of Israel, how Goliath was dishonoring the nation of Israel. And so he wanted, there was something going on here that said, I want to fight against that. And oh, by the way, there's a nice little reward if I do that. And so let me ask you, as you think about your fear and how it's hindered you, or maybe how it's held you back, if you got on the other side of that fear, what's at stake? What would you experience? What would bless your life as a part of that? If you stop and think about it, if you overcome the fear to really reach for another job, a more challenging job, you might actually get the job. Or if you overcame a fear to ask this particular person out or say yes, if they do, you might actually get the person of your dreams. If you overcome the fear to talk about spiritual things with your office mate or your neighbor, you might actually usher someone into the kingdom of God. So think about what's on the other side of your fear. Think about what's at stake. If you do it, what's at stake if you are afraid to do it, all right? Now, thinking is where you begin. Is it rational or irrational? What is really at stake over me overcoming that? You see, for David, you put the, the defying of God and that reward together. He was willing to go in, into the valley against Goliath. 
So when you think about what's at stake in your life and you think about it, it might just give you the motivation you need to take on your greatest fear. Now, the second step is this. It is trust. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 37, David is having this conversation with Saul at headquarters, and this is what he says. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Now, David had this outsized trust in God. Now, how did he get that? How did he get to the point he could trust God to be with him in fighting this huge giant? Well, a couple of things. He trusted God's care and love for himself. In fact, as God rescued him from bears and lions when he was fighting them barehanded, he assimilated this sense that God had a vested interest in his well-being, that God truly cared for him and wanted him to live and had a purpose for his life. And Jesus wants us to get that same understanding deeply rooted in our own minds and hearts. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31, Jesus is talking about the exact same thing. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. What David understood and what God wants you to understand today is that he loves you. He has great care and concern for you. And one of Jesus' disciples, John, later wrote in a letter that perfect love, the love of God, dissipates all the fears in our lives. If we're convinced that God loves us, he's invested in our well-being and our future, then we can do almost anything because we know that he will care for us. The second element of trust is this, is that David uh, tracked God's record of faithfulness. And that's what I want to encourage you to do, to trust the record of God's faithfulness in your life. That's why David could say to Saul, hey, listen, man, I killed a couple of bears barehanded. I killed a couple of lions. And so he could just recite them. He could tick them off. Bear here, lion here on this day, you know, feral hog on another day. I don't know. So, so the deal is David was tracking the times that God had been faithful to him. In fact, David lived out perfectly one of the axioms that we have at our church, and we talk about it a lot, David understood that God's last act of faithfulness was not his last act of faithfulness. God's faithfulness in our lives is not a limited resource. You can't use it up. And so when you are willing to step out in courage and you're willing to overcome your fears and you keep track of how many times God has cared for you and shown up for you in the past, you can depend upon him in the future. You know, if you are in stock trading, uh, you have an investment company, there's a little phrase that people use. You know, past performance doesn't guarantee what? Future results. That is true in investing. It's not true with God. Past performance guarantees future results. And David believed that. Now, that is what it means to trust God, he loves you, he cares for you. He's been faithful in the past. Now, we get to the third thing. We've talked about thinking. We've talked about uh, now trusting. Now it's time to act. How do we act? How did David act in this? And I love this about David. David told himself a new story about his fear. You know, he wasn't telling an old story about his fear, but a new story about his fear. In 1 Samuel 17, verses 45 and 46, we read David's new story. He replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. So that's the story that was going on in David's head. That's what he was thinking and here's the thing. The reason why he was able to think this and tell himself this new story 
is because he had thought about the past and what was at stake, and he was trusting God. He had been tracking God's faithfulness in the past so he could face that nine-foot giant, 27 inches taller than LeBron, and tell himself a new story. God is going to conquer you. I'm going to kill you. So I want to ask you this. As you think about a fear that you have, whether you're competent or not, whether you are strong enough emotionally or not, whether you have what it takes to do your job or not, whether you can start to have spiritual conversations with people around you or not, you have the ability now to begin to act in those ways because you've already done some good thinking and some trusting just like David did. Now, here's the second thing he did. Not only did he tell himself a new story, he also set the right expectations. I just love the part of the story where it said David picked up five smooth stones. Like it only took him one stone to get Goliath, right? So why did he need five? Well, I think David realized, you know, it might take more than one stone to get this dude, right? And I think sometimes we think when we have strongholds in our lives that all it takes is a little bit of prayer and we can just kind of trust God and boom, you know, he just kind of does it without any effort from us or any process from us. No, but overcoming a fear is also a process. And I think he's saying, look, I, I'm, it might take two of these smooth stones. It might take four or five, but he recognized that overcoming Goliath was going to be a process. You know, back in my mid-30s, I uh, developed a fear of flying. And in fact, I had a speaking engagement in central Georgia when I lived down on the west coast of Florida. And I was so overcome by the fear one day, I was supposed to fly there. I went right by the airport and I kept on driving. I just, I, I was afraid. And when I finally was able to overcome that fear, a lot of it by doing some rational thinking about flying, my friend Don Corley who is a psychologist, said, Jim, you need to realize something. You have a greater chance of being dealt two royal flushes in a row in poker than you have going down in a plane crash. I went, well, it's, it's irrational for me to think, to think that I'm, I should be scared. But what happened was it wasn't the first flight back or the second flight back or the third flight. It took me four or five flights before, okay, I'm good. I'm over this. And so set your expectations. You might not overcome this fear tomorrow simply because you heard a message on this. It may take you a while as you tell yourself the new story, as you trust in God, and as you seek to move forward. Set your expectations correctly. And then there's the third thing that you can do is you run toward your fear. I love verses 48 and 49 of chapter 17. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him Reaching into a shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. I love it. Goliath starts moving toward him and what does he do? He runs. He runs toward Goliath. He runs toward the fear. Like first responders who run toward the danger. That's what he did. Now, the only reason why he could do that is because he had thought clearly about the fear and the challenge, and he knew he could trust God to be with him, and he trusted what was at stake, and so he ran headlong into the fear, and he won. And here's the thing. I think we know this. Every time we have stepped up to our fear and stepped away from it, it impacted us. We limp a little bit because we have not been courageous and have not stepped up when we were afraid of illegitimate or irrational things. And that's what David did. That's what God wants for you. He wants for you the ability to face up to the fears that you have in life, the fears from without and the fears from within, and to live a life that is full and free because you think well and you trust God implicitly and you're willing to act upon all that you know and believe. And my hope and prayer for each one of you is that you have that kind of freedom today. So let's close our eyes for a second and just bow our heads. And I want to ask you to do just one simple thing. Just let the one thing that you're most afraid of right now just kind of find its way to your attention. Do you see it? 
do you feel it? Is your heart racing a little bit now that you're really holding that in your mind or your palms sweating a little bit? Now, here's the thing. As you think about that, I want to ask you to ask yourself or take an inventory of these things. As you consider that fear, what's the next thing you need to do? It might simply be to think more clearly about that fear. What story is it telling you? What is at stake about you not facing this fear? Or maybe your next step is trusting God. You know he's been faithful in the past. He'll be faithful again. And so maybe your next step to overcome your fear is to act. Is to act. To be willing uh, to go through a process. To be willing to run into your fear like David. Uh, Father, all of us can confess that fear has stymied us in the past, that we have turned away from our fear when we should have walked forward. And Father, today I pray that the example of David will encourage us and inspire us to think and to trust and to act in a faithful way and break free from our fears. In Jesus' name. Amen.